I want to start out by saying thank you to uh, the Organizer Symposium for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's always an honor to be asked to, to share your ideas and knowledge. And I'm especially uh, thankful for the opportunity to talk to a group dedicated to sustainability. In these really strange times, uh, the idea of sort of forecasting a more positive future is vital. And the idea that I want to talk about is around the, the, the sort of legacy of a Black imagination around sustainability and the complex social and political questions that brings up. My hope is to sort of chart out a way to think about a longer legacy of Black speculation around sustainability and some of the implications that may have as we sort of chart a future that's more equitable and more inclusive and more sustainable. So, uh, as my introduction indicated, I do study comic books, so I want to sometimes incorporate sort of repurpose or remixing comic book imagery. This is from Black. This is from uh, Black Lightning, a comic book from the 1970s, also currently a TV show. Um, so don't be shocked when you see this. Uh, what I'm just trying to do here is set up that I want to talk about Black speculative practice as a framework to think about sustainability. And to do that, I actually want to go back and think about definitions. In particular, uh, Mark Derry, of course, is a cultural theorist who coined the term Afrofuturism in 1994. He did that, though, I think it's important to recognize in light of his understanding of the trauma visited on African Americans and people of color in the Western context. And the question that was driving him in the context of that essay, Black to the Future, where the, the term is coined, is the idea that African Americans in particular um, exist in a world that is very much like an alien abductee, that they live in a sci-fi nightmare. And he makes really cogent points about the nature of that nightmare. He talks about uh, forced fields of intolerance that frustrate movement, official histories that undo deeds that have been done, and technology turned against their bodies in ways that are real and historical. Everything from branding in the age of slavery to medical experiments like the Tuskegee to brutality associated with taser and sort of coercive policing. This idea gave rise to him uh, of the idea of Afrofuturism. And that was the idea that was quickly sort of transformed and, and expanded upon by theorists like Alondra Nelson, who is probably credited as being one of the really strong people who moved the idea of Afrofuturism as a critical lens to understand um, the Western world. And, and she points to uh, some really important ideas that Afrofuturism talks about a Black vision of modernity, of modernity right? So it's an alternative to the ideas of how modernity is set up in a European context. Afrofuturism gives us a way to think about the subject position of Black people in the Western context. And it's also about Black diasporic artistic production. It's a way to think about a kind of epistemology from an an African American, the decentering of European epistemologies and knowledge creation in a way to perhaps see different frameworks, different pathways in terms of how society is operating. Now, this idea that Afrofuturism has these complex meanings is an, an important one because the contemporary moment that we're living in is one very much uh, defined by uh, a series of activism around Afrofuturism. And one of the projects that I'm sort of working on right now is a series of like oral history interviews with Afrofuturists. And in these interviews, I'm really trying to understand how the sort of contemporary moment of Afrofuturist activism uh, connects to this broader practice of Black speculation in the public sphere. And one of the people who's done the most to sort of define this is Dr. Uh, Renaldo Anderson. Anderson is a professor of communication at Harris Stowe State University but he's also a founder and co-lead of something called the Black Speculative Art Movement. And he is really is an active participant in the academic sphere and the public sphere, bringing the notion of like Black speculative practice as a tool for transformation to the public. When he's asked about Afrofuturism in his oral history interviews, he talks about it being a place where overlapping tropes of science fiction, history, trauma, reparations, and politics are, are brought together into a framework that allows uh, black people to work with and change the way that the society operates. 
he goes on to talk about Afrofuturism um, and it's a theorized and a practice that depends on the local population and, and what it's dealing with. And this is an important point because often when we think about contemporary Afrofuturist practice, it's cast as a global diasporic practice. And that's true, but I also think there's a long legacy of this practice within the African, African American context, the American context, that's really important for us to unpack because it offers, I think, a kind of consistent strain of critique, but also a, perhaps a pathway of transformation that's worth investigating. So this idea is an important one, like the Afrofuturism is, is a framework that I think has, has some meaning here that offers a way to think about modernity, offers a way to think about the subject position of Black people, offers a way to think about how local populations um, can deal with problems of oppression and power and transformation, and they're using their imagination to do this. In the past, I've sort of talked about this in the context of speculative practice or speculative capital. And this, I think, is very important because speculative capital in this context is a lot about how those black and brown communities might rethink the landscape that they're in. And this, I think, is, is something that does resonate with more traditional work around planning. I mean, in, even in my own work, as I, I've done in the past with colleagues, we've thought about the rhetoric of planning and, and classic works like the Plan of Chicago and how those plans bring into being a different vision of citizenship, a different vision of property, a different vision of public space. So there's nothing fundamentally odd about thinking about Afrofuturism as a framework to generate new ideas. It's just that the way that Afrofuturism operates perhaps might look a little bit different. And this is important because um, in some recent work, a uh, book called City to Imagine, my colleague and I, Walter Greeson, were really fascinated with the idea of rethinking and, un and unthinking some of the precepts around blackness in media and history. And in particular, I was very interested in the idea of how black practice in the past did very much imagine new spaces and that inspire actual action on the ground. And in particular, I was really concerned in the context of Southern's, Southern town building and Southern community development. And I think this is a practice that is worth noting, but it also ties in with this broader sense of like a kind of speculative uh, imagination, a kind of speculative public practice that's very important to the African-American experience in the US context. In particular, I often like to point out to students that Black people imagining in the public sphere is an inherently political act. And that political act does have consequences in terms of how resources are allocated, both inspiring um, African Americans and, and, and white allies to think about new ways and new paths forwards, but also in terms of like triggering sort of resistance. And this is one of the sort of like natures of this sort of transformation that's worth considering. So. I'm not alone in this. There are, you know, arguably lots of people, really smart people um, that are thinking about this. This is uh, one of the newest works, um, Black Utopia. And, and I love this, this, this quote from the introduction to this book, America has never escaped utopianism, calling the nation America as opposed to a proper geographic area in the United States just towards some futuristic transcendent civic religion. And so that, that, that is true on so many levels. And it also offers up this sort of like question about how the idea of the imagined space is a dominant one that we sort of accept when it's associated with the mainstream, but also a transgressive one when it's sort of associated with those marginalized groups articulating their own space. And this I think is really important because again, when you think about Afrofuturist practice, uh, this is a quote from Kojo Asun where he talks about Afrofuturism as a program of recovering history of counterfutures created in a century that is hostile to Afro, Afro diasporic rejections. So he sees Afrofuturism as a critical tool and, and a place of intervention in terms of the current political landscape. And I, I think that is true. And that sort of taps into the work that you see associated with people like Renato Anderson and his emphasis on Afrofuturism offers a set of tools and a set of, of uh, visions that could be used at the local level to reimagine and recon recast and rethink. And in particular, this is important because at some very basic level, this imaginary sort of landscape is tied in in very real ways to a real landscape, right? The, the place where policy and practice come together. And 
one of the things that, that that sort of animates my thinking about this and inspired by this work, this idea of a future industry. And this little um, diagram sort of brings together some of the spaces that are associated with that, that future industry. As you can see in that construction, um, fictional media, technological projection, uh, market projection, and techno science all come together to create the future industry. And science fiction is an important part of this, this landscape, but it essentially acts as a kind of control through prediction. The vision that we have of the future is at some, uh, at some level deeply tied to the forms and functions that we have right now. And it really takes what, what uh, Ashun talks about as a musological turn to transform that, right? You have to push beyond the boundaries of the established format because it too is a part and a parcel of the landscape of control associated with the contemporary moment, the, the current moment. So the future at some level bends to the, the, the current moment unless a radical reimagining is provided by new visions and new voices and new actions. And so this idea of the future industry as a kind of coercive overlapping set of practices that we're all trapped in becomes an important sort of like moment of pause for us when we think about speculative practice from the perspective of people of color, from marginalized people in the public sphere. So what does this mean in, in sort of a practical st standpoint? And, and can we see this sort of like evidence of a kind of black speculative practice that is transformative, that's existing, that we can tap into and use it as a framework for moving forward? Well, I think that we can. And one of the things I've done recently is that I've been working on a museum exhibit uh, actually connected to the Zoya Hurston Festival called A Past Unremembered. And that's, this is particularly work that is focused on black speculative uh, books and, and work that was written in the late 19th and early 20th century that really stands as a kind of like a prehistory of Afrofuturism that most people do not know. And I think it's worthwhile to, to visit some of these works and think about how these works suggest at the time they were created different pathways and how those pathways were actually manifest in the actions of African-Americans on the ground. Hopefully showing, as I, as I suggest, that there is a black speculative past and that speculative past is generated capital that has inspired action. And that might in fact be a model that we can revisit in the contemporary moment. So one, one way to think about this is to, to think about some of these writers. And one that I like to call attention to is Sutton Griggs, who is probably not very well known uh, today, but at the time that he wrote a book called Imperial in Imperium in the 1890s, he was reacting to uh, the sudden and really brutal decline of African-American access and freedom in the public sphere. The end of Reconstruction um, led to a, really a series of really complicated transformations for African-Americans. And some of the images you see on the page here sort of cover the evolution of, of that reality. Uh, the move to Kansas, again, Kansas and Oklahoma were in the, the late 1870s, early 1880s, thought of as possible havens for African-Americans and sparked the creation of a number of black towns in those places. And so that poster is speaking about that. Uh, the Liberian Exodus is a reference to one other way that African Americans imagine possible places for freedom, escape back to Africa. And again, this is a cyclical pattern that we can associate with the American experience that, that white people in prior to the end of slavery thought often about sending free blacks back to, uh, to Africa so they wouldn't be a negative influence on their slaves. But in the aftermath of the end of reconstruction, there was this consistent move that thought about going back to Africa. Now, the reason that Sutton Griggs' work is in particular uh, meaningful to me and think about the ways that African Americans can react, act and react in, in terms of speculative practice is that he is writing in opposition to both the sort of fictive narratives of white supremacy that are sort of characterized with the rise of the lost cause movement, which is sort of em, 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 um, symbolized by the Klansman novel by Thomas Dixon, uh, which really sort of inspired a new Ku Klux Klan, but also the coercive set of public policies around vagrancy and criminalization of Black people in public space that led to the sort of epidemic of Black people 
uh, being used for convict labor across the South, which was, of course, very important in the South's economic transformation in the latter part of the 20th century. Griggs' uh, answer to this was to imagine a novel where a secret society of African Americans uh, organized to take over the state of Texas. Uh, this is actually a little, a little bit of the plan that's printed in that book. I always like to point out to students, you read this plan today, this is still a good plan. This is still a good plan. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> but in Imperial, in Imperial was a, uh, at some level, a Black nationalist narrative that was intended to inspire African Americans to think very strongly about uh, themselves as a sort of subject group to inspire them to action, not necessarily taking over the state of Texas or taking over any state, but to organize themselves, be loyal to the race. And then one of the themes of the novel has to do with uh, sort of racial solidarity and was publicly sort of engaged with as a really transformative work. And it's important to sort of recognize that work as uh, something that I think really inspired a number of African Americans at the time to sort of rethink the landscape in which they were operating. Now, uh, Griggs's response in the late 1890s might seem completely at some level extreme, you know, far-fetched, and we can be critical of, of a kind of speculative work, but the idea itself of African Americans carving off space and creating something that would be sustainable for themselves was actually a very important idea. And we can see it stretched out from those towns that I mentioned being created in places like Kansas and Oklahoma in the late uh, 1880s and 1890s, as well as, as places like Florida, Eatonville, for instance. Uh, and, and also in the work and in, in networks of, of cooperation and activism created by Booker T. Washington. Of course, Washington is very famous for uh, his seeming compromise around segregation. You know, he very famously gave his Atlanta Compromise speech in 1895 at the Con Exposition. But Washington was also very, very, very much about creating a kind of like Black imaginary around work and self-sustaining that was pitching both to African Americans, but also to white allies. And he wrote many books sort of crafting a kind of public persona and narrative around how this sort of industrial work, community building, framework that he talks about was an important way to answer a question for the United States in terms of like what to do with Black people. And uh, in books like Working with the Hands, he points to this idea of the African Americans trapped as they were in a legacy that they were tied to the land. That's really where most of their skill sets was. His decision to work with African Americans around this sort of industrial education model was uh, actually a sort of pragmatic um, pathway that recognized the challenge posed by African Americans in the space that they were in. And he sought to use that opportunity to really push forward in terms of like helping African Americans to be self sustainable. This is really important because he celebrated this idea, both in terms of like the rights that he did, but also in terms of creating networks of cooperation, the Negro Business League, um, his rural education. Um, uh, program with the Rosenwald schools where he built over 5,000 rural schools in the American South. These are schools that would not have been built without the sort of support um, he's offered through his cooperation with Julius Rosenwald, the executive from Chicago, the Sil Roebuck uh, millionaire. And these schools provided education in a space where the sort of state infrastructure was failing. And, and indeed the business that these schools were in was often connected to a kind of set of cooperative visions that Washington himself was articulating and promoting across the South. Like he did a number of tours, often giving sort of pep talks to African Americans that were in the press, and it's important to recognize this, in the press, the white press tended to report these, these inter interactions one way, the black press tended to report them another way. They might be at the same event, but they saw a very different set of ideas and motivations and visions for the future being articulated. But it's no question that, that Washington celebrated the success of African Americans that were in particular able to carve out and create communities that could sustain themselves, foster black education, foster black economic development, 
and become a kind of cornerstone of growth and success. He talked about this in Negro and Business. And one of the one of the things about that book that is great that he celebrates many of these communities where his graduates had set up schools, model at the Zuski University. They, they set up these normal and industrial schools to carry out the work of educating African-Americans and industrial, but also classical education modes. So it's important to recognize industrial education wasn't just simply about working with the hands, it was also about a being a critical and engaged thinker. And in these books, you know, he celebrated Eatonville, a town I know well, and talked about Eatonville as sort of delivering on both this sort of economic and social uplift message that was so important to African-Americans. And here you can see um, some of the, the deeds, uh, uh, document and, and an actual picture of J.E. Clark's uh, um, home in Eatonville. And Clark, of course, was a leading resident who helped sell most of the land to the residents of Eatonville. And Eatonville itself is a community that kind of represents an important sort of answer to the question of the future development uh, for African Americans in the South during the 1890s. Again, at that period where Sutton Griggs is writing is sort of like you know, a speculative, practice, speculative novel about taking over Texas. And Eatonville, as Clark will point out in the Eatonville speaker, uh, you could see this is the newspaper that they published. And you can see in the upper right corner, this slogan that I think is very instructive, colored people in the United States solve the great race problem, secure a home in Eatonville, Florida. And this is a, an, an important sort of point. Eatonville itself, like many of the black towns that were created in this, in this period, is sort of carved out of, of space and land that had been owned by white people. And this was not a simple exercise because for many people across the South, many African-American across the South, they found real resistance in them owning land. It's only the sort of actions of sympathetic whites in the case of Eatonville, a man named Lewis Lawrence, who was willing to buy land and then in turn sell that land and work with J.E. Clark to sell that land to African-Americans they were able to sort of very quickly sell the land and to create the town of Eatonville. Incorporation is an important part of that story. These, this community is similar to many communities that were created in the same period, but incorporation gave them the political power to maintain their boundaries and resist some of the so developmental pressures that basically absorb some of the other African-American settlements that were created at the exact same time period. So the message that you find in the Eatonville speaker and really the media message about Eatonville that appears across the newspaper record in the United States in this period is one of a kind of black utopian vision that this is a place where black people are able to own land, they have political and social power, and they're able to sort of like live a life free from the dangers posed by racism that are so very real. And now this quote, this, this is an image pulled from a newspaper uh, in Omaha, as a matter of fact. And we have this quote, again, from J.E. Clark, where he says, we always have vegetables to sell. There's always ready sales for these things. In the winter, in the hotels open, they bring high prices. And really, uh, in, in this case, this Florida case, there is a, a kind of a New South economy of the orange culture of Florida, in particular, is very important, the agricultural culture that allows African-Americans to sell their sort of excess uh, produce to hotels in that region. But even if they don't sell that produce, they are self-sufficient. This is one of the things that remains when you talk to people in Eatonville, the land and the, the sustainability of the land uh, to help African-Americans feed themselves, they're owning their property. They are really free at some level for some of the more blatant elements of coercive practice associated with um, the sort of loss of access to the quote unquote public space uh, in this sort of pivotal period in the early 20th century. And this has become one of the things that I think is very important when we think about how black people used to envision freedom, right? If they have all the things that allowed them to still be full citizenship, uh, have full citizenship, they're able to feed themselves, they're able to have access to property, they're able to educate themselves, they are able to exist in a world in itself that is in some total then they are successful. And this is really why I think um, I often like to refer to as a kind of material citizenship that was something that was very clear in the rhetoric being articulated by people like Booker T. Washington and reinforced by sort of like black nationalists 
uh, figures like a Sutton Grist, that their, their speculation about what freedom entails really is dependent upon this idea of Black people and being at levels, at some level being independent, um, sequestered in their own spaces and working to sort of maintain and protect themselves against the hostility of the wider world. The, the politics of that though, of course, are very, very complicated and uh, political biracialism uh, that Stephen Hahn talks about in his great book, A Nation Under Our Feet, is an important part of like the reality that some of these African-Americans are dealing with, right? Like if you have a black town that is all black people, uh, that, that is something that might be able to be sustained, especially in the case of Eatonville, if it's able to incorporate. But many of these towns were not incorporated. And so these alliances that are political alliances between sort of like-minded in this period, Republicans, black and white, become an important way that African-Americans are able to pursue their vision. So a political alliance that recognizes the need for cooperation around uh, efforts to promote and protect the citizenship of people of color uh, are, are an important part of another important path that's articulated by the work of people like this in this period. And again, I turn to, to this, this space in Florida, in Eatonville in Central Florida. If Eatonville is a sort of independent black community that, that you know, incorporated itself and maintained its own space, not very far away, two miles away, another black community that had been founded around the same time and had many people who were connected to Eatonville, Hannibal Square, gets incorporated into uh, a small town called Winter Park, a community I know well. And the, the black leaders there have common cause with Republican leaders and they advocate for a kind of biracial community. And this becomes their vision of a, a kind of black utopia. And, and this is actually a digital project where I've sort of recovered the fragments of the Republican newspaper published by an African-American throughout the 1890s in that, in that town, Winter Park, where you can see the sort of ideology of a kind of biracial cooperation that the white community might build a school, the black community builds a school. The white community thinks about uh, uh, infrastructure improvements, they incorporate the black community. Even when, when the Winter Park is incorporated as a town, uh, black, black people from Hannibal Square are on the city council, right? This is how, this is how much it's sort of like biracial politics is so key. And this is important to recognize, like in the, in the height of what historians would like to call them the fear, the vision of cooperation between black and white Republicans in this small town was one of just that cooperation and mutual benefit. This is a, unfortunately um, an important sort of point that the public sphere is a, a sphere that is always under threat for African-Americans in this period and access to, to the media, the creation of this newspaper, for instance, came after a long set of sort of debates about incorporation and, and inclusion of African-Americans in these spaces. And this really becomes like one of the examples that I think is really important. Uh, African-Americans, this newspaper, The Advocate, is created by African-American and named Gus Henderson, uh, who's the business manager, along with other Black leaders. Their goal is really to sort of advocate, to, to tell the truth, as it were, about the story of development. And the vision that they articulate is one of civil society that has success for both Black and white. They do this in the context of a moment where increasingly the opportunities for black and white people in, this, in, in the region are declining. And they hold on to this vision for as long as possible, but indeed as the sort of like transformation of the public sphere reaches its, its sort of crescendo and Florida, in Florida's case, the rewriting of the constitution, the passage of uh, the grandfather clause, the reading comprehension test, so on and so forth, all these things that sort of transform the South. Eventually, these sort of biracial cooperation models falter, right? They falter under both these sort of legal, legal attacks, but they also falter under extra legal violence. And this is another one of the things that sort of defines this region, where um, Edenville and Hannibal Square are really only two miles apart their destiny after this crucial period at the turn of the century, by the time we get to 1900, the establishment of Jim Crow, Jim Crow segregation, has created a radically different set of circumstances for these two communities. 
Eatonville is still an independent town that lives on a sort of self-sustaining uh, agricultural model. Hannibal Square is actually detached from the city of Winter Park um, for about a decade, well, really about 15, 20 years, and then reincorporated. And there's never been a, a black elected official, but from, Winter, from Hannibal Square and Winter Park since the 1890s. And when the town was founded, they had black officials. And so that little, that little, that little microcosm of like the sort of historic black town that everyone knows, Eatonville, on the home of Zorn or Hurston, but really two miles away, a uh, community that, that sort of emerged at the same time have had radically different um, uh, sort of like historical past. And a lot of it has to do with this ability for the communities to sort of chart their own path to tell a story, but also the reality of the political landscape that rapidly and in some in, in very real way detrimentally changes under the, under the feet of black people. And so that's a period in that sort of latter part of the 19th century, other part of the 20th century, that's really important. And again, when I think about this, I think about Sutton Grizz as an example of black people working through ideas about how to approach this question of like sustaining themselves. Uh, another figure in the show and another figure who I think is important to, to, to keep in mind is W.B. Du Bois. Uh, the reason that Du Bois is, is, is so important, of course, is because as an academic, he's probably one of the most famous Black intellectuals of the 20th century. But in his speculative work, which many people for many years didn't really spend a lot of time with, he does sort of chart a path where he thinks about the, the challenges of transforming society. And there are two speculative works in particular, which are sort of along a continuum. One's uh, The Comet, which is a short story. And then there's The Dark Princess. And in these two stories, you can really see the boys struggling with the implications of trying to find some pathway for a brighter future. And The Comet in particular is a story that I have students read and we, we talk about in part because it's a, you know, a dystopian fiction story, not to spoil it, but the, the long and the short of it is that there's a comet that comes through and kills everyone, seemingly kills everyone on the planet. And the last two people left on earth are a black man and a white woman. And the implication in the story, of course, is that those two people are going to have to repopulate the world. And there are a lot of questions raised by the comet as a short story. One is, you know, who is the audience for this story? And two is, you know, what was the hope that the boys had in terms of like a listening, a transformative experience for the reader? His later work, Dark Princess, uh, is different in the sense that you can make the argument in the comment that in the prose and the action and the pace of that story, the boys offers up a, a kind of transformative pathway for the, the white character, the white woman who recognizes with the destruction of the entire social order she's been raised that you know this black person, this black man that she's talking to and trying to survive with is a human being. Uh, in The Dark Princess, the nature of that structure seemingly isn't, can't be overcome. And, and the stark shift in those stories that are really written in a very short period between, you, between them tells you a lot about the worsening conditions of African-Americans and the nature of speculative practice not being able to overcome it. Um, this is important because of course, Du Bois is not a, a figure, the voice of, of understanding of the black experience. You know, Some of his visualizations of African-American experience are very important and very telling in part because he marries both a kind of sociological understanding with like a real understanding also of the political disruptions created by violence and displacement visited on African-Americans. And so the work that he does often takes into account the nature of sort of anti-Black violence and anti-Black sentiment and the fact that the system itself allows for those disruptions to undermine Black people's abilities. And this is actually a little bit from the comment in this dark princess. Um, so in the early 20th century, Dan, I would, I would argue that there's a, a tradition of Black speculative practice that's tied to like black activism that's very clear. And that, that idea doesn't go away in, in the post-war period, but the story I think becomes a lot grimmer. And that's one of the things that I think is a challenge for us to, to truly understand. 
Um, and here, of course, Jane Baldwin probably says it best. I'm gonna see if this works. It does. A boy last week, he was 16 in San Francisco, told me on television. Thank God we got him to talk. Maybe somebody will start to listen. He said, I got no country, I've got no flag. Now he's only 16 years old. And I couldn't say you do. I don't have any evidence to prove that he does. They were tearing down his house because San Francisco is engaging as all, most northern cities now are engaged in something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. So Baldwin's uh, sort of critique in the documentary, uh, Take This Hammer, is actually available online. That's and that you can see the interviews that he's talking about. Uh, but, you know, his very succinct way of describing urban renewal as Negro removal is an important and, and, and sort of vital way to understand this sort of post-war transformation. Uh, there's a ton of work, a ton of books, a ton of digital work that makes clear the nature of the unequal transformation of the post-war period funded by the state and its devastating consequences for people of color not just simply black people either, really all non-white people, and that's a lot of people, are on the wrong end of the transformation associated with urban renewal. But the consequences, of course, for black people are detrimental in, in enormous ways. And of course, a, a great digital project called Mapping Inequality uh, tells that story. And this is a story we know well, I don't need to repeat it, but the visualization here is always really meaningful, I think, for the students and for public, because the narratives attached to the Black spaces becomes really a kind of insurmountable mental block for the rest of the world, right? The idea that Black spaces are detrimental to the success of white spaces, therefore Black people are detrimental to the success of, of, of white people and their property, becomes a kind of like benchmark that shapes the view and understanding of urban development in the post-war period. And it's important to, to think about uh, when you look at the comments, which are available in Mapping Inequality, they're, they're racist, but as I said, the clarifying remarks here really make it clear the, the critical nature of othering all non-white people as a part of this overarching and all-encompassing narrative of, and, and vision of what, quote unquote, a safe space or desirable space might be. Be you be Jewish, be you be Italian, or the worst of all, Black, your presence becomes hazardous to the success of white people, to the success of future generations, to the success of society. And this really opens the door to a kind of coercive, negative set of practices that are supported by the state, right? These are, these are not ideas that are just simply held by individuals. They become part and parcel of how society looks at space and those become policies that drive practice. And really in order to change that, we have to fundamentally rethink our vision of these things. Um, for African-Americans in this period, I, I do not think that they abandon this idea of speculative practice, but it's in, intriguing to understand that like the previous generations, they also have to rely on a kind of vision of like creating a black space that is at some level free of black people and here I want to talk about the idea of Soul City, not necessarily directly influenced by a speculative work, but clearly speculative practice on the, on the part of Floyd McKendrick, who McKissick, who actually visions Soul City as a kind of black new town that would be supported by the federal government in North Carolina. And this quote for him is, is really important. The black man has been searching for identity and destiny in cities. He should be able to find it in the plains of Warren County. There's a really complicated sense of like, again, McKissick revisiting the same sort of ideology that was articulated by Booker T. Washington in the early part of the 20th century as he sort of promoting um, Soul City in the 1970s. And of course, he's able to do this because of the really complicated politics. You know, Soul City is actually supported by uh, Richard Nixon because McKissick supported Nixon and Nixon, of course, was all about a Southern strategy. And so he's trying to like uh, nurture black voters and Soul City sort of um, becomes a model for or a possible model for a kind of black town. And the initial offering it is designed to be clearly a black town. Like it, its vision has to be a, a totally black space. In order for it to move forward though, they sort of step back from that. 
but the full implications of, of it as a, a place that offers black people finally the freedom to, to live their sort of economic and, and stabilize their social, social, social political identity is clear. And it, again, it connects very directly to the kind of vision that we might associate with sort of black visions of sustainability from the early part of the 20th century. Um, this was a part of the New Towns project that was developed by HUD in the 1970s. While it did not come to fruition, it does, as I, as I want to, to stress, provide us one sense of how African-Americans continue to sort of like struggle with the vision of like, what does the future hold for us in a society that is intrinsically, problematically anti-Black, right? They have to create something for their own. And these visions of Soul City that you see here, as I say, this is the first city uh, in the world that's built around Black, that little advertisement. And it melds Black and white people. But in its hearts of hearts, the original ideology of Soul City was that it would be for Black people. And they only grudgingly opened it up to, to white people. Now, it's important to, to, to think about this, this idea of speculative capital and return to it, I think, because in our contemporary moment, the contemporary Afrofuturist uh, activism is very much tied to, uh, again, a sense of like, what is it going to take to, to protect Black people? And Octavia Butler is probably one of the figures whose work, in particular, writing in the 1990s, foreshadows many of the things that we understand today in terms of like the challenges facing African Americans. I'm particularly thinking about the parable of the sour and, and the character there uh, who, this is written in 1993, and the character, some of the characters and situations in this book are eerily familiar to our contemporary moment. And Butler in particular was always very clear that one of the things that she wanted to talk about in her work was the, the, the nature of hierarchy and the ex exploitation of power that is inherent to that as the, the bane of, of, of the existence of, the, of humanity. Right, it's power and hierarchies that create this opportunity for exploitation and um, really sort of the lack of opportunity for African Americans. Right, how can how do you unpack that? How do you how do you change that? Well, her argument was to actually offer up uh, a kind of cooperative, nurturing, resilient society that embrace that embraces the ideology that brings people together. Again, this is not an idea that is necessarily new. But like those previous versions of that sort of biracial cooperation, it does fundamentally rely on the rethinking of the precepts of how society operates to make it work. Uh, the Parable of the Sour is, is a graphic novel today. And again, the sort of visual culture of contemporary Afrofuturism um, very much relies on, on understanding and visioning these, these, these communities. And, and the work of uh, John Jennings and Damian Duffy in particular uh, blends elements of critical race theory and critical critical making to, to think about their projects, be it these adaptations like Parable of the Sour or original projects to think about the nature of trauma, think about the nature of frameworks of power, thinking about the nature of uh, politics in a new way. And when we think about what are the sort of tenets of Afrofuturism as a cogent theoretical practice, this decentering of, of modernity, this sort of embrace of a different set of ideas this becomes one of the ways that like a temporary Afrofuturists who are thinking about development actually embrace these ideas in a lot of ways. Like they, they, they turn to this. And, I, and again, I, I wanna think about this in terms of like contemporary actors. Uh, Ingrid Lefleur, who is a curator and, and artist based out of Detroit, uh, ran for mayor a few years ago as an Afrofuturist. And she very much uses Afrofuturism as a political framework, right? As a social framework, as a, a toolkit for reimagining the world. And in particular, while her mayoral candidacy didn't necessarily, you know, she didn't win, the ideas of Afrofuturism as a set of like starting points for rethinking policy practice, that is very real. And then everything from the adoption of sort of cryptocurrencies as a, a sort of like a toolkit to free African-American communities from uh, the treacherous nature of, of sort of white centered finance to envisioning more cooperative networks that are smaller, more agile, more centered around neighborhoods of color. 
these are ideas that are being pursued by the social group that she's a part of in Detroit, even as we speak. And they're borrowing very heavily from other Afrofuturists around the world, and other sort of like tech-centered liberatory toolkits that are being developed um, in Africa that are designed because Africa is sort of like leapfrogging us in terms of infrastructure to create more versatile, more sustainable, more open systems that are not necessarily modeled on the patterns that have been established in the West. So this is, a, I think, at some level, a vibrant moment for us to think about this continuing legacy of, of speculative practice and how policies and practices not tied to the past might in fact offer a, a blueprint for a better, more sustainable, more equitable future. But these are pathways and they still need us to, to sort of develop the practical steps that are going to make that happen. And I think if we go out and look and, and see, we can see individual pockets and people like an Inga LeFleur like organizations like Black Space pursuing these ideas in their own way. And I think this opens up the, the door to a really vibrant set of like ways that we might rethink urban development, rethink practice and policy that might be sustainable for the 21st century. So what does that mean ultimately? Well, if that future industry that I talked about um, earlier is real, and I think it is, is there a way for us to find a Black future industry that might in fact nurture a future set of practices that are more liberatory, more sustainable, more equitable. And I think this is one of the ways that we might do it. Like we, we, we go to those areas, we think about the fictional media, we, we cover those, those, those black speculative works. We think about the technological projection and think about the, the ideas of uh, invention, not necessarily from a European white perspective, but from perspective of, of minority people and marginalized people we think about these market predictions and recognize that in fact, the fastest growing middle class on the planet is in Africa. One of the fastest growing sort of like uh, common economic markets is in Africa. That Africa is a place where I think some ideas around sustainability, around um, social economic development are gonna really sort of define the future. And of course, the techno science, the legacy of innovation that's so important is so sort of dominated by a very particular set of precepts and illusions that we understand in American context, those, those technoscience narratives need to be expanded and take into account those voices left out, be they people of color, women, queer people, all those things need to, to be reimagined and remixed to create a different kind of future industry. And I think that actually offers up a pathway to the future. 